done great things. Oh, hero of heaven, you conquer the grave. You freed every captive and break every chain. Oh, God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awake and alive. Oh, Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high. Oh, have done great things. You've been faithful. You've been faithful through every storm. You'll be faithful forevermore. You have done great things. And I know you will do it again. For your promise is yes and amen. Savior, your name lifted high, oh God, you have done great things, hallelujah, and hallelujah, God, above it all, hallelujah, God, unshakable, hallelujah, you have done great things, do it again, hallelujah. You freed every captive and break every chain, oh God. You have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awake and alive. Oh Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high, oh God. You have done great things. You have done great things. Oh God, you do great things. Amen. Give God a hand. All right. Y'all may be seated. Come on, Alan. Good morning. Join me as we go to the Lord in prayer. Our Father, I thank you so much this morning, Father, that our doors are open, that we can freely come and worship you and lift our voices. And, and Father, just come together as, as a church family. Father, just love on each other. We thank you for those that are here. And, Father, we pray for those that are not, for whatever the reason may be. Those that are sick, we lift up to you. We pray that you'll be with them and comfort them and touch them. Father, those that are caregivers that are taking care of them, Father, we pray for strength for them. We pray, Father, as we continue this service that you'll help us to free our mind. Father, forget about what's going on around us in the world for just a few minutes and just do nothing but pay attention to your word. And Father, we just pray that you'll just help us not only to, to hear it but apply it to our hearts and our lives. We thank you again this morning for this country. Father, I lift those up that are protecting us this morning, Father, and just pray that you'll just keep them safe. Just continue to go with us, and Father, just continue to pour your blessings out upon us. And Father, most importantly, help us to not take those blessings for granted. These things we ask in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Sing on the upward way, new heights I'm gaining every day. Still praying as I onward bound, Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stay. 
house to ride and fears dismay of some bad well where these abound my prayer my aim is for higher ground Lord lift me up and let me stand my faith on heaven table
right, this last one's a new one. I'm going to ask if y'all would please stand. And so often we try to fight our own battles. So often we try to say, God, I got this. Let me do this. And then when we do this, we realize I shouldn't have done that. And we fall back to God. The song is called Defender. And so it says, you know, he knows everything that's going to happen anyway, so why don't we just let him be in charge? You know, like, God, just direct me. Do in me what you, what you will. Um, and so the, um, the chorus, excuse me, the bridge goes, when I thought I lost me, you knew where I left me. <laughs> I like that. You reintroduced me to your love. You picked up all the pieces and put me back together. You're the defender of my heart. So it's not that him that, that turns his back on us, most of the time, even as Christians, we like to turn our back on him and do our own thing. And so what's awesome is whenever we turn back around, he's there with open arms saying, I'm, I'm off here, I'll always be here, and I'll always be ready to be who, who you want. You be who I want you to be, and I'll be your God. Amen? I got it. All right. Let's go.
Father, thank you so much for who you are. Lord, when we mess everything up, you're there to put our pieces back together. We thank you so much for who you are and what you've done. Lord, right now, I thank you for the seniors we're about to recognize, Lord. I thank you for their accomplishments, Lord. I thank you, Lord, that that they're here this morning, God, and I pray right now, Lord, that that you will move in them in in a mighty way, Lord, and Lord, they will be the Christians that they need to be at home, at school, at college, wherever they go, Lord. I pray, Lord, that that you're allowed to shine in and through them. In your awesome name we pray. go back ain't no explanation how i saw the light he found me and he set me free and he brought me back to life blame it on the transformation change down to the car it's love that's real and i can't sit still but my name's not shame no more no more great god almighty don't change me great god almighty he don't change me you gotta change Seem fine. Oh. Maybe your world was upside down and it's right between me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No matter when it happened, at seven or ninety-five. Move your feet, cause you are free and never been more alive. You gotta shake, shake, shake. Like you change, change, change. Brand new look so good on you. So shake like you've been changed. Come on, shake. Shake! 
I'm going to ask that y'all awkwardly come up here. Miss Carly, Mr. Blaine, and Miss Savannah, come stand up here. That's the deal. Y'all stand here and look at them and grin while I read, and then y'all get one of these. All right. You come over. You, you come. You come over here. This is no, no, no. Blaine in the middle. Hey, stay, stay, stay. Good. All right. You good? Look at them and grin awkwardly. All right. Here we go. Miss Carly Nicole McCoy. Did I say that right? Good. Five points. Just graduated from Discovery Christian School, where she received a cord for over 250 community service hours served. She also received a cord for being a Chick-fil-A Leadership Academy 12th grade representative. My pleasure. All right. She made MAIS All-Star Softball Team her senior year, and she received a scholarship from Colian, where she will attend in the fall, majoring in nursing. Miss Carly Nicole McCoy. Hang on. All right, next we have Mr. Thomas Blaine Barlow. Blaine received Superintendent Scholar and will graduate with high honors and 12th in his class. He also received a Certificate of Recognition from Jones County Junior College, JC, woo, for rising excellence, and he was selected as a Mississippi Scholar and received a $4,000 scholarship from Yates Construction. Lane will attend Jones County Junior College in the fall for two years, then plans on going to Ole Miss, I'm sorry, and will major, Cal's like, mm-hmm, and will major in electrical engineering, Mr. Thomas Blaine Barlow. <laughs> All righty, and lastly, but certainly not leastly, Savannah Rose McMillan. She also just graduated from Discovery Christian School, where she received a cord for over 213 community service hours served. She received honorable mention All-Star District for 2021 and the Rebound Award for 2021 Basketball, as well as numerous Katniss Everdeen Awards in archery. All right, she also received a cord for being a Chick-fil-A Leadership Academy 12th grade representative, and Savannah will be attending Bellhaven University in the fall, pursuing a master's degree in sports medicine. Miss Savannah Rose McMillan. All right, y'all face me. All right. For being such good sports. And I know my wife put these in the right order. I'm just paranoid. All right, Miss Carly. This is yours. Is this a cool brown? All right. All right, y'all turn back around and show everybody what you got. Yay. All right, let's give another round of applause for our 2022 graduates. I'm going to see you. You good. All right, we also like to mish, mish, mission, mention we have a few college graduates. Ms. Kayla Liddell, she can be there. Ms. Bailey Sharbro, is she here? Stand up awkwardly. Uh-huh, stand up. All right. Come here, I got you something. Oh, yeah. You can't get it unless you come up here. <laughs> She's like, I'm never coming up here again. All right, while she's making it, we also got Miss McKenzie Spitzley, Miss McKenzie Jones, and Reed Barlow. So let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> you did good. Hi. Welcome. All righty. Your turn, brother. All right. Thank you, Steve. Oh, man, so excited for all those graduates making that next uh, chapter finishing one and moving on to the next in your life, and uh, man, so many things that God has already used you to do, so many things he's already done in your lives, and so many things he has ahead of you to do and for him to do in your lives, and so don't take for granted the things that you've accomplished, but also don't just simply rest on them, because God has more that he will have you accomplish for his glory and for your betterment. Uh, we're thankful that we have uh, a great group of seniors graduating high school, a great group of, of uh, I don't know if we call them seniors, but, but adults grow, you know, growing and graduating from college and getting those degrees. Uh, God just shows us that it's always about continuing to grow. And that's the same thing for us as Christians. It's the same thing for us that we need to do in our faith is continue to grow. And those steps of growth are not always easy. Those steps of growth are not always simple. Those steps of growth are not always fun, but they are always good as long as we're growing in the Lord. 
he would have us to grow. And sometimes that growth means discomfort. Sometimes that growth means uh, being told stuff we don't want to hear. Uh, sometimes that growth means having to change habits and having to change thoughts and opinions. But all of that goes towards us growing in our faith. One of the great things that God has given us, and, and one of the best things that he's given us, is Scripture. And uh, 1 Peter is where we've been the last several Sundays. We're going to turn back here to 1 Peter chapter 3 this morning. And, uh, and, and talking about uh, the sermon series called Exiles, Hope in 1 Peter. And now up to this point, we've, we've talked about the idea of being exiles. Peter in chapter 1 writes that, that we're elect exiles. And so we, we are people who are not necessarily in the place we choose to be, but we're in the place that we've been placed and been put and, uh, and that God is still at work. And, and we get now in chapter 3 to where after he's told us about serving others, after he's told us about submitting to the authorities that God has placed over us in our lives, now we start to get more of the hope about how that works and about how we don't have to shrink from those moments of challenge. We don't have to shrink from those moments of suffering. We don't have to shrink from or be intimidated by or dread those moments that lead to our growth. But instead, we can embrace those. And there's great hope even when we're going through those things that we wouldn't choose to go through, those things that God uses to produce in us perseverance and, 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 and growth that leads to that hope and that gives us that hope as we go through those things each day. And, uh, and God tells us that, that he is the one who we can put our hope in, and indeed, he is our hope. Peter would tell you firsthand because he got to walk side by side, speak face to face with Jesus, to hear Jesus' audible voice to see and partake in the miracles that Jesus performed. Peter would tell you that there's nothing else out there that we need to gain our, gain our hope from or seek to gain our hope from other than Jesus. You and I today have not had the opportunity to see and to hear with our ears Jesus' voice and his actions and his miracles. Sometimes we've, we've seen him, but we haven't seen him physically there in front of us. And scripture says that we are even to be more blessed because we that have believed even without seeing, that takes an extra measure of faith than those like Peter who got to see it firsthand. At any rate, this morning, we get to put our hope in Jesus, and it's in him and only in him that we get to find that hope that only he brings. The, the verses that we, we kind of skipped over, we actually talked about them this past Wednesday night, and if you're missing some of the, the parts of First Peter that we don't cover in the sermon series, come be a part of prayer meetings. We're covering those verses there. Uh, over the next couple of weeks. But we talked about, as we left off last week, we talked about that it was about honoring the emperor. Not, it wasn't just only about that, but that was part of how to serve God, was to honor and to respect those authorities that God's placed on us and allowed to be put in power on this earth in our earthly lives. And, and, and that all went into this idea of serving others and, and that, that we, would, we would begin to grow in serving others in every way that leads them to faith in Jesus Christ and leads them to growth in their faith in Jesus Christ. And, and that, that led into a, a discussion uh, with three groups of people that we talked about on Wednesday night. Slaves, wives, those two are not together by the way, right? Slaves, wives, and husbands. Talked about three different specific instances that people find themselves in, three different uh, situations in life that people might find themselves in and how they can honor even the authority that's not godly in their life, how they can honor God by submitting to and serving that authority and therefore getting a chance to show what the gospel has done in their lives. So we, we pick up in 1 Peter chapter 3, beginning with verse 8, and we read, Finally, all of you, talking about people who put their faith in Jesus, all of you be like-minded, be sympathetic, love one another, be compassionate and humble. And what we learn there in verse 8, as well as the verses before that, is that hope begins with humility, right? Go back and take a look at what he says. He says, all of you, be like-minded. You know what? When we rest in our pride, when we rest in how right we are, or I am, or you are, um, like-mindedness doesn't usually pop up. You ever try to be like-minded in a group of people? Let's just say it's two people. Have you ever tried to be like-minded in everything in your marriage? Pretty easy, huh? <laughs> no. <laughs> we are different. We were different when we were, when we were created. We were different as we were born. We were different as we were raised. And somehow God saw fit to join two different people together in a marriage. And we don't always agree 
If you say that you agree, then the rest of us will disagree with you, right? We all in our marriages have found that there are times where the husband sees it one way and the wife sees it another way. And you know what? Sometimes one or the other or both are wrong. But sometimes one or the other or both are right. So what do we do in all that? How do we, how do we navigate that? How, does, how do we even hope to accomplish like-mindedness? And if we have a hard time accomplishing like-mindedness in our marriage where we chose to be with one another, man, how do we even begin to think about what he's talking about beyond just the, the sanctity of our, of our marriage one-on-one in a group of the believers in Jesus Christ that are many, that are many more than what we've got here in our sanctuary, that, that go around the world and have for many, many years and will for years to come until Jesus' return. How can we ever hope to find like-mindedness between them? Well, it has to start with humility. Because if we're sitting back and and trying to figure out, well, why don't they get it because I'm right, it's never going to bring us to like-mindedness. Like-mindedness is a result of submission. And it fits right into the context of what Peter's been talking about in the first two chapters and the beginning of the third. Without submission, there is no like-mindedness. First off, without submission to faith in Jesus Christ, we have no hope of being like-minded. And I give you the example of our country right now. By and large, our country is not surrendered to faith in Jesus Christ. That, you know, we can talk about being a Christian nation, we can celebrate our freedoms, but if you go out and you take, if you were able to take a poll of every person who lived in the United States of America right now, most of them are not biblical believers in Jesus Christ. They may go to churches. They may uh, support ministries, they may do all kinds of things, but they're not biblical believers in Jesus Christ. And it shows in what they say and what they do and how they act. It shows in what they champion and what they seek. That's just the reality that we live in. That's not new. That's been around a long time. Peter's writing to the church in a culture, in a nation, in an empire, same way. And from all that, and like-mindedness is an afterthought so many times, isn't it? In our country, like-mindedness is, man, it's, it, it seems like we only get like-mindedness when we're rallying together against something else. That's a terrible way to get like-mindedness. Like-mindedness is hard to come by. It begins with submission. It begins with submission of our own pride. He says, be like-minded. It also involves, and it also includes being sympathetic. What does sympathetic mean? It means that I feel, that I that I. I take in and I try to experience or I have experience and I recall that experience with someone who's going through the same thing. There are some situations that we cannot be sympathetic because there's many situations that each of us have gone through that other people have not and vice versa. So we can't always be sympathetic to the very letter of the word and the definition, but what he's saying here is, look, it's not just about us being right and somebody else being wrong. Be sympathetic. In every situation, in every situation, when we're right and we're tempted to stand on just the the fact that we're right and somebody else is wrong, we have to remember that there have been times in our life when when the tables have been turned. And it may not have been with that exact person, may not have been with that exact issue, but there have been times in our life where we've been wrong. And if we don't believe that, then we've been wrong all along. We have all been wrong at some point. And the idea of being sympathetic is to know that what someone else is going through and struggling with right now that might produce some actions or some words or some some attitudes that we don't like and that we believe are wrong, well, we've probably had some of those same types of struggles. Maybe not the same exact thing, probably not the same exact thing, but we've also had things go in our lives that would cause us to say the wrong thing, to do the wrong thing, to have the wrong attitude. Be sympathetic in this and that we're all in this together. We're all, sorry, high school musical graduation reference there for some of you, Uh, but we we all have been in the same place. That idea of being sympathetic starts with that, that we would surrender and be like-minded, that we would know that they're where we are, whoever they may be, that we would love one another. Why does love one another come third in this this verse? Because if you don't do the first two, you're not going to be able to do the third one. You can't. You can say it. The words, I love you, or I love them, or I love them to death, usually followed by but, you know, whatever we don't like about them, right? Uh, We can say how much we love. We can put the bumper sticker and the T-shirt on, and we can talk about love, even sing about love. But until we've surrendered our own high horse, until we've surrendered and submitted 
our own hearts until we've tried to understand that the other person that we might be not like-minded with or against or might be against us, they've got some things going on that we've had similar things going on and try to be sympathetic there. We won't be able to love one another. It won't happen. We might try. We might really want to, but we won't be able to without those first two steps. And then the fourth step, he says, be compassionate and humble. Compassion and humility don't come until God's love has been made manifest in us, until he's revealed what his love is like. We can be, we can be passionate about things, but true compassion, godly compassion, biblical compassion doesn't come to us until we've understood God's love. And we can't understand God's love until we've submitted, until we've understood these things that he talks about in verse 8. Man, verse 8 could preach its own sermon, maybe its own sermon series, but we need to move on. We see here, though, that in all of this, hope begins with humility. And then we read in the next couple of verses. He says this. He says in verse 9, Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult. On the contrary, repay evil with blessing, because to this you were called so that you may inherit a blessing. For whoever would love life and see good days must keep their tongue from evil and their lips from deceitful speech. They must turn from evil and do good. They must seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are attentive to their prayer, but the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Who is going to harm you if you are eager to do good? What we see here is, is that humility. What does that look like in our lives? Going through it somewhat quickly here in these next few moments, he says don't repay evil for evil. That's the way of vengeance. That's the way of the world, right? You hurt me, well, I'll hurt you at least that much, if not more. I'll show you that you don't ever mess with me. Man, we operate in that way in so many different areas of our life. We operate that way emotionally. We operate that way verbally. We operate that way attitudinally. And we operate in, in, in that in a way in our organizations and our institutions. Man, nobody's going get, to get one over on me. You know that if you're a Christian this morning, you're thinking that way, you've got a one, a big one, over on Christ. Because we have injured God in our unholiness, and yet he still loves us and dies for us. He says, don't repay evil with evil. He also says, don't repay insult with insult. Man, I'm going to tell you something. You, you guys know this because you, you've lived life too. And even if you're not very old, you've, you've probably experienced this. Sometimes people insult us. Sometimes people say all kinds of things about us and against us. Sometimes they're based in enough truth to hurt, and sometimes they're just based in out and out right lies. <laughs> but they do it. They do say it, right? And the temptation for us is, well, oh yeah, well, they said this about me. Well, let me just tell you something about them. And what Peter's saying here through the Holy Spirit is that's not the way. That's not showing submission. That's not the way that inherits this hope that comes only from God. That is not the way that God has called us to live, nor the way that he's died for us to be able to live. This whole idea of repaying evil for evil, insult for insult, is contrary. It's exactly opposite to what God did. If God did it that way, then guess what? Every time we sin, something terrible would happen to us. Has that happened in your life? Not in mine. I've sinned a whole lot more than terrible things have happened to me. That's probably true about you, too. God doesn't operate that way. He calls us not to operate the way we want and ask him to bless it. He calls us to be changed by him and to operate in our lives by submitting to him and letting him show us how to do things the way he does them. He says, on the contrary, repay evil with blessing. Now that's, that's, that's foreign to us, isn't it? When somebody hurts us, our first thought is not always to bless them. When somebody you know, excludes us or makes us feel bad or someone hurts, you know, hurts us physically or emotionally, we don't start to think, man, what's the best way I can make them feel good about themselves? That's something that only God can bring about in our life, and it only can come through with this faith in Christ that changes us from the inside out. He says, on the contrary, repay evil with blessing. Why? Because to this you were called so that you may inherit a blessing. There's far too many people who claim to be Christians who are the most vengeful and judgmental people on the planet, and they're expecting to receive the blessing of heaven after they live this life of outright just meanness and, and, and outright exclusivity and outright judgmentalism and they expect to walk into heaven and go ah oh, look welcome me in he says right here he says if you're expecting to inherit a blessing it comes from god being 
alive in you, making you alive to become a blessing. Verse 10, he says, For whoever would love life and see good days must keep their tongue from evil and their lips from deceitful speech. Well, that's, a, that's not a small thing, is it? You know, James would tell us that, uh, that, that you know, taming the tongue is a pretty big deal, like a, like a small rudder turns a big ship, so the tongue does with our hearts and with our lives. What we say is going to show every time who we really are. And the more we say it, the more it shows and more pr- proves who we actually are in our hearts. Elsewhere we read that out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks, right? And so what he's saying here, he's saying, look, you've got to, you know, if you, if you want to have life in Christ, if you want to live life in Christ and enjoy life in Christ, part of that is watching your mouth. <laughs> part of that is watching what we say. Part of that is watching how we say it and why we say it and what we're trying to accomplish by saying it and the things that we're a part of when we talk. He says they must turn from evil and do good. In other words, we don't just do evil because we have the freedom to do it. We do evil uh, and we repent of it and turn from that so that God in his power and only his power can teach us and lead us to do good. He says they must seek peace and pursue it. Christians are not the ones to stir the pot. Christians are not the ones who make the gap between differing parties wider. People are not the ones who further the argument. In our generations, we have gotten into this, I believe, misguided thought that we somehow need to defend God. We sang it this morning, we're not his defender, he's our defender. And so what we need to do is do it, as that song said, and, I, and thank you still for being sensitive to the Holy Spirit, because I, I, I barely knew that song. But it says exactly this, that we need to make sure that we are letting him do it his way. His way is exactly what Peter's talking about here. They must turn from evil and do good. They must seek peace and pursue it, not seek more division, not seek to win. If you're in Christ, you've already won. (laughs) You don't have to win the argument. You've won everything. You've won the very inheritance of heaven. You've won the inheritance of of, of being co-heirs with Christ, Jesus Christ, God Almighty. You've won already. So what difference does it make if people think they've won in this life? We don't have to be vindictive, Christian. We don't ha- in fact, we're not supposed to be vindictive. We've got to turn from evil and do good and seek peace and pursue it. It says, for the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are attentive to their prayer. That's what we want, right? We want to ask God and hear him to say yes and, and to see him work and answer our prayers. The only way that works is if we are submitting our lives to line up to pray for the things that he wants, to pray for his will, not just ours. And when we do that, we see that he does answer our prayers because he's changed us to pray for different things. Is it wrong to pray for the things that we want? No, but it's absolutely wrong to live a life as a Christian and only always worry about what we want. I heard somebody say, and this is convicting, and it cuts me to the bone even today as I quote it. They said this, they said, if every one of your prayers today was answered, Would it affect anybody but you? That's tough. Man, that's tough. Because how many times am I most convicted to spend the most amount of time when I'm not happy? As opposed to knowing that there's so many people in my life and outside the scope of my life that are far less happy than I am, even in my own happiness. If we're going to want God to answer our prayers, we need to make sure that we are submitting and laying down our will that our will might become his will, or better yet, said better, his will would become ours. He says, for the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are attentive to their prayer, but the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. And I think what he's saying right there is, we don't have to be set with our face against the people that do evil, because God's already got that taken care of. How silly would it be If a man is defending his family, or a woman for that matter, and as they're taking care of whatever the threat is, the two-year-old comes up and goes, eh, (laughs) and like throws in one extra hit, one extra punch, one extra defense. It'd be silly, right? When we try to defend God like we do, when we try to stand in judgment over people who are doing evil in our eyes, even if it's truly evil in God's eyes, it's kind of like that. It's kind of like our father has taken care of everything, and we just kind of go up and go, eh. <laughs> like, like we got to get one last you know, jibe in to say we were a part of it. No, join God in taking care of things. He's already taken care of. It's already done. 
those who appear to be winning here that hurt our feelings so much because they don't say the things that we believe in, they don't teach the things that we understand and that we, that we cling to, God's already taken care of that. <laughs> it's already taken, he doesn't need our help. He simply needs our submission and our obedience, and that's where our hope comes from. He says, who's going to harm you if you're eager to do good? You know what happens when we're constantly trying to fix everything and trying to be so right in front of everybody? You know what we end up with? We end up getting hurt a lot because we keep putting ourselves in the position to be hurt. And a lot of times, eventually, we end up getting hurt because someone says, aha, you're no better than I am. And we have to say, oh, you're right. I've been standing up here on my, you know, on my high horse, on my pedestal. It's hard to say that when I'm actually standing on a high horse up here above you guys, but because this is true of me too. There's so many times where I have to realize, oh, man, the thing that I thought was so wrong that they did, I'm in the middle of that doing my, my, the same thing. And that's when I have to get on my knees and say, God, you fix me. And you know what, Lord? You fix them. You don't need me to do it. I need you to do it. What's going to harm us if we're eager to do good? It harms us when we're, evil, when we're eager to do evil. It harms us when we're eager to always be right and make everybody else wrong. But when we're eager to do good, when that is what we've submitted our lives to and that's what God is growing us in, we figure out that the harm that used to hurt us so deeply and so badly usually isn't near as much as it seemed to be at the time. What we learn here is, is that humility, that same humility that our hope comes from, that humility allows us to suffer righteously. When he says what harm will come to you if you seek to do good, it's not that you'll never be hurt, it's not that you'll never suffer, but it will be that you'll be suffering in the way that Christ suffered. You'll be suffering, we'll be suffering for the truth, for what's right, not for things that we manufacture, stuff that we invent, stuff that we keep on to ourselves. Humility allows us to suffer righteously. We read in verse 14, but even if you should suffer for what is right, you're blessed. Do not fear their threats. Do not be frightened. But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience, so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. For it is better, if it is God's will, to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. Now again, several parts of this chapter could, could preach a long time, and I won't do that to you this morning. Simply to suffice to say this, we often strike back out of our fear. We strike back out of our feeling of insecurity. We strike back out of our feeling of, again, not wanting to let anyone get one over on us. He says instead, do what's right even when you suffer, especially when you suffer for doing what's right. He says, in that, you're blessed. Blessed people don't seek revenge. People who don't understand their blessing seek revenge. Blessed people don't need to get even because blessed people know that they've been blessed, that they've already been made far better than even. They've already been taken well past what they deserve. He says, do not fear their threats. Don't be frightened. If we're not frightened, we don't have to retaliate. He says, but in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Revering Christ as Lord is a symbol and is a, is a picture of submitting. It's submission at its best that we would simply revere him as Lord, literally bow down before him, not just a knee, not just bow low, but on our face, as low as we can get, in a picture of showing that he is high and he is great, and we are blessed to even be able to be brought into his presence. He says, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. <laughs> How many of us are really quick to talk about what's wrong. But if we were to have witness training tonight to talk about how we could go out and share our faith with everybody, a lot of us that find it so easy to say how wrong everybody else is would have a hard time coming in here and learning how to share our faith. You don't have to wonder if that's true because it's been done in this church and other churches many times. Man, you ain't gotta, you ain't gotta look far to find somebody who points out a mistake. You ain't gotta look far <laughs> to find somebody who thinks they can do it a lot better but you know what you have to look far and wide for in these days? It's someone who would actually give the reason for the hope that makes them think they're right to begin with. I hate that that's true. But guys, let's just be honest. That's true. <laughs> if I told you tonight that instead of Bible study and the you know, 20 or 30 folks, adults that usually sit in this section of the room, even though it's really bright and they want to move to this section, 
Uh, those of y'all who come on Sunday night, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, but if I told you that we were going to do nothing but learn how to share our faith and we were going to actually go out and do it, I guarantee you, less than 10 people. Not because they're not good people, not because I don't love them, not because I'm any better than them, but folks don't show up for that. He says here, be eager. <laughs> Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. So many of us are so ready to just say, well, that's just the way it's been, and now you're trying to change it, and that's bad. Or oh, that's the way my mama or my grandmama or somebody else that I love has taught me to believe, and you're speaking against that, or you're acting against that, and I don't like it, so you're wrong. There's so very few people who are living their lives in a way that say, the reason these things hurt me, the reason why evil in the world bothers me is because I've given my life to Christ and he deserves better. There are very few people who have an easy time being prepared to give an answer for their faith and the hope that comes from it compared to the number of people who are willing to point out how wrong everybody is. You know what, guys? That's why I've stopped listening so much to the people who want to point it all out. Now, you may be sitting there going, you know what, and that's why I stopped listening to you, big boy. And that's okay, too. That's between you and the Lord. But here's the deal. Yeah, <laughs> things go wrong. Things go bad. But I don't stake my life on any of those things. I stake my life on the faith and the truth of Jesus Christ. That's what I need to be talking about. Not politics, not economics, not relationships, not any of that stuff. All those other things are just simply some places where we desire to reflect the truth of the gospel. But if we're afraid to share the truth of the gospel, what are we really doing? And he says in verse 15, don't, don't share that testimony of what God's done in your life and say, and that's why you're wrong, right? As preachers, we've got to be careful with that, right? He says, do this with gentleness and respect. Today, understand that even though I might get fired up about this this morning, I'm right there with you. Because you know what? There's times in my life where if I wasn't the one leading the evangelism training, I might not show up either. Again, I can sympathize. I, I'm, I'm with you. If that's you this morning, I've been there. And I, there's no promise that I won't be there again. Do it with gentleness and respect, but do it. <laughs> but do it. He says, keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. Well, how does that work? How does that, how does that, you know, that justice come in that situation? Well, it only comes when the standard is the word of God. And if we live our lives and we stand on the word of God, not the word of tradition, not the word of religion, not the word of, of anything else, we stand on the word of God, that day when, when it is decision time, when Jesus is going to say, come in, well done, my good and faithful servant, or depart from me, I never knew you, at that moment, everything will be taken care of. Any vengeance that needed to be done will be done by the only one that can, by God himself. It'll be made right. We don't have to make it right before then. That's not our call. Surrendering so that we're on the right side of that is what we're supposed to do. He says, for it's better if it's God's will to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. We see here that godly suffering imitates Christ. And so in these last few verses this morning, if you'll just kind of follow with me, I'm not going to do a lot of preaching out of this part. But understand that when we do suffer, we can find hope because Christ has suffered for us. We see that godly suffering imitates Christ when we read these next verses, starting with verse 18. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteousness for the unrighteous, excuse me, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive in the spirit. After being made alive again, he went and made proclamation to the imprisoned spirits, to those who were disobedient long ago when God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. In it, the ark, only a few people, eight in all, were saved through water. And this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also, not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a clear conscience towards God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at God's right hand with angels, authorities, and powers in submission to him. This morning, as we wrap up our time of the message, Jesus has already gone where he calls us to go. What we read there in the last few verses of chapter 3 of 1 Peter is just a remembrance 
of the things that Jesus has already taken care of so that we don't have to worry with those things. He says that Jesus has died and been made alive. In, in his resurrection, he has not only appeared to his people, but he's also gone and taken care of some things that we could never take care of. When we suffer, when we hurt, when we go through disagreement and injury and all the things that go with it, Jesus has already been there. He's already gone before. And he's the one who says, join me, so that when you suffer, you'll have perspective on it. And even more than that, as we've read this morning, it'll be a blessing, and you'll know it. Let him, we need to let him, make us to look more and more like him with every passing moment of our lives. If our faith is in Jesus, that's what we're about. If we're not about it, then we have to ask ourselves the question, is our faith really in Jesus? This morning, you have an opportunity. It's not the only time. As long as you have breath, you have an opportunity, but we give you a special time as a part of a worship service each and every Sunday that God allows us to have one to respond to him. I just simply ask you this question this morning. Is Jesus your Lord or are you trying to be? If you're still trying to be, then today know that Jesus, the Lord of lords, and the the one who is above all and who will and is exalted above all, he loves you. He died for you. Would you submit your life to him and find the hope in him that you're trying to find in everything else, whether you realize it or not? Today you can do that. He's a prayer away. He's a commitment of our heart away that he'll bring us to. Is he bringing you to that this morning? For those of us that are Christians who have put our faith in Jesus, who have been saved, what's our attitude? What are we showing that our hope is in? Is it in our side of the aisle? Is it in our way of thinking about life? Or is it in the true word of God made complete? in the flesh of Jesus Christ. Maybe this morning if you're a Christian, that's not where <laughs> that's not where our hope is lying. That's not what our attitude is. It's not who we're about. But maybe tonight or today would be a time to repent so that later on today we can know that we are in Christ fully and committed to him. Maybe this morning you're you've been visiting with us and you're looking to to unite formally with our church. You're already a part of us by nature of the fact that we know you and we're growing with you. But if you want to come and Move your membership here. We'd love to have you. Whatever other prayer concern might be on your heart, maybe you need to just come and pray at this altar. I'd encourage you this morning, don't stand still. Don't let it go on. Graduates, you've accomplished much, but none of your accomplishments will ever, ever measure up as great as they are to what you can do when you respond to Jesus Christ. So this invitation is to our graduates as well. Let's go to the Lord in prayer together. Father God, we thank you, Lord, for our time together this morning in your word. We thank you for the recognition of these wonderful guys and girls who have accomplished great things. But Lord, I pray above all for each and every one of us that the thing, the accomplishment that we would cling most to is putting our faith in you and you alone. And Lord, that even in that, we would know that it's something you've accomplished that we might be able to appreciate. Father God, for the one who doesn't know you, let them come to you now. Put their faith in Jesus and be changed, be brought from death and sin to life in Christ and to find that hope that only comes from him. Lord God, this morning, for those of us who know Jesus, let that show forth in everything that we do. Let us be willing to share our faith in Jesus, not just our thoughts on things. Father, let us give every way we can to serve you in telling your story, the gospel. Father God, whatever else you want to do in hearts today, Lord God, would you do it as only you can. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Please stand.
Y'all please have a seat. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and introduce two folks to you that you already know very well. And uh, we're excited to have Eric and Kathy McMillan. So y'all come on up, guys. Doing a little out of order because we normally, we got a few things. Uh, we're going to still take our offering here in just a minute. We've got some stuff going on at the end of the service. But you guys know Eric and Kathy. They have been members of Harrisville Baptist Church. God led them to another church for a season. And this morning they came and, and said they, they want to come back. And uh, they want to come back and be members of our church here at Harrisville again. We want to welcome them back in. They are both believers in Jesus Christ. They are both baptized believers. They have been serving in, in, in different churches as well as this one. And I think they're signed up to serve in Bible school, so that's always a good thing. Uh, so uh, let that be an example to anybody who's not. They joined the church today, and they were already signed up to be in Bible school. But uh, I, I just asked the church, what's your pleasure as, as them coming to be members? All in favor, just say amen. amen. And any opposed, we'll talk to you later. No, you're, you're good. We're glad to have Eric and Kathy. Guys, if y'all will sit here, and then at the, at the end of the service, come on up. And y'all come by and let them know how glad we are to have them. So, guys, we love you and look forward to serving with you. All right. Usher, if you'll come forward. Harrisville. 